Inga Ligasova did not seem the least bit nervous about her first ever television interview. She's a successful businesswoman, having run a company for the last 15 years. Necessary and inspiring items on the table include a set of photographs of the main people in her life. In the middle stands this picture of her father. My dad went to Chernobyl by pure accident. On April the 26, 1986, Valery Ligasov, deputy head of the Kurchatov Institute of Atomic Energy, was having a dilemma. Whether to go to a regular meeting at the office or to take his family outside of Moscow on a warm spring day. That was until he received a distress call which changed his life. Go to Chernobyl, a voice said. Some kind of blast had happened there. This was exactly two years before one of the country's leading scientists was found dead in his Moscow apartment. April the 26, 1986. Workers at the nuclear power plant in Chernobyl, some hundred kilometers from the Ukrainian capital Kiev, performed a technical experiment. They reduced the reactor's output to later bring it to a temporary stop. This exercise was meant to test the security systems. Suddenly they received a call from the energy ministry in Kiev. A woman's voice asked them to return to normal levels so they could deal with evening peak time. The personnel did so, but suddenly the operation went wrong. They lacked the knowledge about the physics of the reactor. They knew only which buttons to push, but knew nothing about how the reactor worked. The personnel put the reactor into an uncontrollable state. One of the staff on shift saw something wasn't right, panicked and pushed the emergency stop button. In just nine seconds, the reactor in the fourth block at the nuclear plant, which held almost 200 tons of radioactive fuel, exploded. It emitted large amounts of radiation into the atmosphere. The wind then carried it further into Europe and Russia. This event changed the course of history, becoming the world's worst man-made disaster. Nobody could tell the extent of the meltdown in the first few hours. In the morning, a special governmental commission was sent to Chernobyl. Representing scientific circles was Valery Ligasov, the deputy head of the Kurchatov Institute of Atomic Energy, which created the RBMK nuclear reactor used in Chernobyl. Even though Ligasov wasn't a specialist in nuclear reactors, he specialized in chemistry and molecular physics he was the only high-ranking scientist available at the moment, as the others were on holiday. He stayed. That's because I was returning from a business trip. And he always took my mother and came to meet me at the airport. But when I landed, I saw my mother was alone. And I didn't recognize her. I asked, what happened? Are you feeling well? She replied, it seems that today we lost our dad. On his arrival at Chernobyl, Ligasov saw a terrifying picture, which he later described in a short interview. Usually, a nuclear power plant is a building with a pipe which never emits anything. And here, for the first time, I saw a station with a fire raging above it. It made the sky turn purple. From the very beginning, Ligasov tried to assess what had happened. He tried to determine whether the reactor had been destroyed. There was a mass hysteria at the site. Everyone thought that the explosion formed a certain cluster which could operate by itself. And the first calculations suggested that one-tenth of the core was actually working. We said that it would stop working eventually. It can't carry on by itself. But nobody cared to listen to the scientists. Ligasov alongside members of the commission boarded a helicopter and hovered 300 meters above the debris. The levels of radiation at that height were very dangerous. But he was there long enough to realize the reactor was gone forever. 
Valeri understood the situation was far more serious than he had been led to believe. He had to make a decision, and fast. The first thing my father demanded before starting the technical work was that all of the people from the surrounding areas must be evacuated. It may seem hard to believe, but nobody thought about it. He realized tens of thousands of people had found themselves at the epicenter of a strong radioactive wave. He said, we have no time to sign papers, we just need you to accept our decision to evacuate Pripyat completely. Legasov's plea wasn't instantly met. Moscow did not authorize it straight away. This was the pattern in the Soviet Union, that in a, such a perfect society, <laughs> accidents don't happen, airplanes do not fall down, there are no explosions in factories and nuclear power plants work beautifully. Only 36 hours later did Legasov get what he had asked for. Pripyat and the surrounding areas were evacuated. I said, OK, I give you my approval. Start organizing it immediately. They managed to gather several trains and several thousand buses. And by 2 or 3 p.m. the city of Pripyat was empty. I was told over the phone that there were only dogs left on the streets. I knew that the town had been evacuated forever. But I couldn't find the moral strength to tell it to the people. Besides, if we told them that they were leaving forever, it would take them quite a while to pack their bags. But the radiation levels were already very dangerous. So we told them it was a temporary move. But the scientist understood. In just several days, the radiation would reach Kiev. Just in time for the Labor Day demonstration on May the 1st. The death toll would be enormous. Legasov insisted the event should not be held, as not to endanger people's lives. Meanwhile, Europe grew suspicious as traces of radiation were detected near Stockholm. The place where they discovered it was at the Swedish nuclear plant. Uh, because the radioactivity was so high, and they thought, my good, something has happened here. And then, and gradually, they discovered that they had also high radioactivity in several other places in Sweden. So that was, they understood, it was elsewhere. But Moscow sanctioned an information blockade, concealing the facts from residents, as with the rest of the world. So for the Kremlin, cancelling the May 1st celebrations would mean openly admitting something was wrong. This was the battle Ligasov failed to win. On May the 1st, 1986, just five days after the blast, thousands marched here on Krishatik, the main street of Kiev, in traditional Labor Day demonstration. It was believed that they exposed themselves to large doses of radiation. Though officials up to this very day denounced this. The southwest wind blew radiation clouds towards Belarus and a little towards Russia. Thank God it didn't touch Ukraine. Another big question at the time was how much of the 200 tons of radioactive fuel had actually stayed inside the reactor. Nobody can understand how much nuclear fuel had been emitted. Radiation readings at the site were way over the top. And many thought that there was no fuel left inside and that all of it was in the air. But if all the fuel had been emitted, then it would have been absolutely deadly there, absolutely impossible to work. The first conclusion, only 3% of the fuel left the core. The rest was still inside. Legasov started to work out how to decrease the radioactive threat coming from the open reactor. His first decision was to bombard it with burr, lead and sand. Helicopters took off with a difficult task. Heat and radiation levels at the height of 200 meters were a critical health risk. It was very hard to make a helicopter hover in such heat, up to 200 degrees, at a height of 200 meters. That's how hot it was. In the burning heat, helicopters hovered over the exploded reactor. 
Engineers threw down sacks while the pilots struggled to control the helicopter. After one to two flights like this, the engineers vomited on landing. The heat, along with the radiation, was too much for them. Legasov got into an army vehicle and drove directly to the destroyed block, braving strong radiation levels. And more concerns were raised. When the reactor was on fire, the workers tried to extinguish it with water, so they put tons of water inside. Scientists had a suspicion that if this water was mixed with the heated mass, then there would be a very powerful steam explosion and a lot of radioactive material would again be emitted. Legasov was also very worried that there could be some serious problems with groundwaters. He thought that the radiation could poison the Pripyat and Dnepr rivers. Legasov appeared nervous and chain smoked. But he, just as all of other specialists on the site, couldn't find a solution. Within 10 days, Legasov returned to Moscow. He met the Politburo and described the scale of the situation. But no agreement was reached at the meeting as to what to do next. Ligasov made a short stop at home. He was very tanned. But this wasn't because of the sun. By that time, he was literally saturated with radiation. He had no strength to talk, and we felt we shouldn't have asked him anything. Ligasov was almost listless. Inga says he did not even realize that he was in Moscow. Nevertheless, he changed his clothes and went back to Chernobyl. I think from the very first day, my father knew well what lay ahead of him. When he flew there, hardly anybody understood what had happened. Nobody could explain anything. And I think when he first looked at the destroyed reactor, he understood. His life had ended there. Meanwhile, as the temperature beneath the reactor's core continued to rise, increasing fears of another blast, a group of volunteers went into the devil's mouth, under the glowing reactor, to find out that there was practically no water there. Another explosion could not happen. In mid-May 1986, Ligasov celebrated his first triumph at Chernobyl. The radiation and temperature levels decreased, the disaster was seen as localized. The scientist did his job and could now go home. But for some reason, Ligasov decided to stay. It was no use telling him not to go. Even my mother didn't try to persuade him, not because she didn't want to, but because she knew it was useless. He had an excessive sense of responsibility, which he inherited from his father. Responsibility for us, for mom, for colleagues, for the country. He saw himself as part of the country. In his childhood years, Valery Ligasov was indeed a keen child. His old school still has his records, full of top marks. The principal once said, this boy will become either a well-known scientist or a politician. There was never a time when he couldn't answer a question. It seemed he knew everything. He studied things not for the sake of a good grade, but because he wanted to know. Ligasov transferred this model onto his own family. He could discuss serious subjects with us, little kids. It was very interesting because, on the one hand, it was weird. And on the other, he asked a question so that we ourselves had to find the answers. He wasn't a very tender or sentimental father. But he taught us to think, that's for sure. Ligasov's rise through the career ranks was something special at the time. A member of the Presidium of the Academy of Sciences at the age of 49, the deputy head of the country's main institute of atomic energy, the Kurchatov, the recipient of multiple awards. So many achievements by the age of 50 was unprecedented. Ligasov found his place in the elite of Soviet science. 
As a result, he was often envied and even disliked in his circle for being too successful. By 1986, he had all possible state awards, except for the highest civil honor, the hero of social labor. He was meant to receive the Geroy Sotstruda award automatically when he turned 50. That was natural for scientists in those times. But the Chernobyl blast changed these plans. In summer 1986, a strong wave of criticism from European countries hit the Soviet Union. They accused Moscow of concealing information about the disaster, which led to nuclear contamination of the whole area. The Kremlin understood that the country's reputation had to be saved. A special team from the Kurchatov Institute compiled a special report about the causes and scale of the fallout to be presented to the world's main nuclear watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Legasov was responsible for this report. A bunch of people practically lived in our house during the compilation of this report. People came and went, bought some papers, numbers, stayed overnight. There were sheets of writing lying all over the house. Many people took part in the compiling of this report. And my father insisted on double-checking all of the figures. He insisted that every word must be the truth. Valery was not a specialist in nuclear reactors and not a high-ranking politician. But nevertheless, in August 1986, he traveled to Vienna to face a task which many thought of as impossible, to save his country's face. Given Europe's strongly negative stance on the Chernobyl disaster, it was more like another battle rather than just a public statement. He came to the IAEA headquarters to confront the predators from nuclear physics. People who knew everything on the issue, people who could not have been lied to or couldn't have been tricked. He had to speak the truth, keep in mind which country he represented. And I remember that I asked the, the Soviet embassy um, how long will he speak because we were planning the logistics and we were having hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people from all around the world. And I said, they, they said, well, maybe three or four hours. Legasov read out the 400-page report and survived a three-hour Q&A session. The world's top 500 experts in the nuclear field asked him questions, which he gave full answers to. In the end, he received a standing ovation for his efforts. It was yet another triumph. His country's name had been cleared, and Legasov was ranked in the world's top 10 scientists. He made absolutely infuriated people understand. Yes, we have this disaster, but now let's work together and try to prevent such disasters from ever happening again. Here was the period when the glasnost be began, the perestroika and the glasnost. And, uh, and the Western world was stunned then that here comes someone who speaks freely. Legasov was very sincere and he was very knowledgeable. He was just uh, confident in telling the truth as he knew it. Back in Moscow, a triumphant Legasov was nominated for the Hero of Social Labor Medal. But on the day, he brought back a watch. He and his team had been denied the country's highest award. I think it was personal. The staff at the institution were afraid that he would become their boss, and given his reformative nature, would change everything. His ideas weren't met with support. Meanwhile, the effects of the radiation on Ligasov's body were starting to show. His health deteriorated rapidly and he went into hospital. His family feared it was cancer. He was seriously ill. During the last few months, he practically didn't eat or sleep. Can you imagine how hard it is for someone not to sleep at all? He had strong radiation sickness. Meanwhile, in Chernobyl, scientists managed to get inside the damaged reactor and broke the news that no traces of radioactive fuel had been found inside. We drilled a hole in the reactor and saw that it was empty. Only air. No sand and asbestos from helicopters. No filters. 
and the helicopters had missed the target, hitting everything but the reactor. It emerged that a second explosion was not going to happen, that bombarding the reactor with burr and lead was useless, and that the helicopter pilots had died for nothing. It turned out that Ligasov had made a serious mistake. We did extinguish the blaze. Secondly, we did manage to lower the level of radiation. Hundreds of times lower. So it means we didn't just do it for nothing. On August the 29th, 1987, Ligasov attempted suicide while in hospital. Doctors managed to save him, and he soon returned to work. The scientist threw himself into finding out what had caused the Chernobyl disaster and ways of preventing anything like this from happening again. He started gathering information about all of the technological disasters in the world, why they had happened, and in particular, he tried to work out a certain algorithm for humanity to minimize critical situations. And not only in the field of nuclear energy, but in the whole of the industrial sector. The scientist urged the government to create an institute of technological risk and security and wrote an article entitled My duty is to let everyone know. He criticized the Soviet nuclear reactor building scheme, lashed out at poorly qualified personnel, ruled that nobody cared about nuclear security in the Soviet Union and that Chernobyl could have happened much earlier. The profound communist Legasov lashed out at something untouchable, the Soviet system. Though it was pretty much perestroika style, the article did not pass the census and wasn't published. He asked me once, what do you think about perestroika? Well, back then I was young and didn't understand everything. I said, yes, it's excellent, we need changes. And then he looked at me and said, Yes, it's good, but I'm not sure that it is being done by the right people. However, for a second time, Ligasov was nominated for the Hero of Social Labor Award. His colleagues congratulated him. Everyone was sure that this time he would definitely get it. But again, he wasn't on the final list. I asked. Why was Legasov deprived of the award? I was told that as far as he was the deputy head of the institute which created the exploded reactor, people wouldn't understand it if he was given this award, as if the institute was to blame. He never thought about doing anything for the sake of another award. He didn't feel heroic about his actions. He was just doing his job. Ligasov made one final push. He worked out a plan to create a special council, which would deal with the stagnation in Soviet science and reform it. On April the 26th, 1988, the second anniversary of the Chernobyl blast, he presented it to the Academy of Sciences. The plan was not approved. Ligasov came back home feeling devastated. The next morning his son found him hanged in his Moscow apartment. One of the Soviet Union's highly acclaimed scientists had allegedly committed suicide. His widow later said that her husband was brave and strong, but that he had been destroyed. And so I was called up by the Institute's management and was told to check his belongings for radiation. I went to his office and laid everything out on the table. I turned on the meter and it showed radiation levels. And it continued to just beep and beep. I said his belongings must be destroyed. The scientist lost his final battle. He did not become the head of the institution he had designed and did not publish all of his work but he eventually succeeded in the most important of his goals. Nowadays there is no alternative to nuclear energy. And that, I believe, should reconcile Legasov's spirit. He and his generation created a fundamental basis for the development of nuclear energy. The lessons of Chernobyl have been learned. Nowadays, nuclear power stations all across the planet pay special attention to safety. 
Take the Taiwan nuclear facility in southeastern China, for instance, which was recently described by the International Atomic Energy Agency as the world's safest. Engineers say that even if a 20-ton aircraft crashes into the facility, the reactor would stay unharmed. But it's also well protected against any kind of human error. Valery Ligasov was buried among the country's elite at the Novodevichy Cemetery in Moscow. A short obit in a newspaper said that Soviet science had suffered a great loss. In 1996 he was posthumously awarded the Hero of Russia medal and his school was named after him. Alexander Boravoy, who was a so-called Chernobyl liquidator, is now fighting to declassify what is believed to be a top-secret archive, which holds a compilation of documents made by Ligasov. They tell the real story of Chernobyl and the true situation within the first few hours of the disaster. Boravoy says it could prove invaluable for the prevention of future such incidents, so that there will never be another Chernobyl.